All right, take your Bibles out, turn to Matthew chapter 28. Uh, It's a day that we've been looking forward to for a while. We spoke two weeks ago on January 1 about the priority of the Bible in the life of the believer and encouraging folks to be in the Word and this year. And so hopefully uh, you're joining us with that and uh, enjoying that time. And uh, last Sunday we had a special time. Uh, did you enjoy last Sunday? Yes. Awesome. I did too. Just an opportunity to hear uh, from our elders and what their prayers are for you this year. Uh, it was just powerful, great opportunity. If you missed that, I encourage you, strongly encourage you to go back and watch that. Um, and then this Sunday, uh, basically setting up 2023, reminding us of the vision of Summit Church. And so today uh, is really, uh, might be re- repetitive for some of you, repetition for some of you. Uh, for some of you, this might be the first time you're ever hearing it and be like, oh, that's what we're doing here. Um, so uh, that's our hope. So we're going to throw our vision statement up here on the screen. I want to read it, and then we're going to look at Matthew chapter 28, and then we're going to talk about, come back to this, okay? Summit, Summit Community Church. Summit Community Church will glorify God and advance His kingdom by making disciples of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. How'd I do? Did I miss anything? We'll glorify God and advance His kingdom by making disciples of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is why we exist. That is why we are here. That's our vision statement. You'll see that on our website. You see that hopefully all over the place. Hopefully, if you're a member here, you have that memorized, right? Okay, very good. We'll work on that. Maybe that's the goal of 2023, right? Um, but Summit Community Church will glorify God and advance His kingdom by making disciples of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what we stand for. That's why we're here. We don't have a mission statement, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to cover that because I believe the church's mission statement, God's mission uh, has a church. We don't have a mission, right? It is, is found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So let's look at that together. Okay, where it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And so as we look at our vision statement this morning, I want to point out five things to you about it. That's going to be our five points today. And then we're going to have a golf lesson. Sound good? Figured it was so cold outside we should have a golf lesson and think warm thoughts, right? So as we look at this, I actually want to start at the end of this vision statement because I think there's five key elements to this vision for Summit Church that I want to highlight this morning that we're going to focus on, that we're going to center on, that really are everything that we are about. And so we're going to start with the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we are worthless without Him, right? We are worthless without Him, okay? I am with you always, right? Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always always to the end of the age. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need, not we want, we have to have it, right? Sunday after Sunday, day after day, as Summit continues to operate, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we talk about Summit this morning, I challenge you, I encourage you, think about your individual family. My individual family needs, my life needs the power of the Holy Spirit, moment by moment, decision by decision. Need the power of the Holy Spirit. I am nothing without Him. Jesus says it, for apart from me, you can do nothing. The, the, the comfort in that, right? The comfort in that, some of you may think, well, that's pretty defeating, right? I'm nothing, right? Well, think about it this way. You're not alone, right? You don't have to face anything alone. We don't have to face this alone. We can't do it by ourselves, but we don't have to do it by ourselves. We get to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And even, and even when we think about it, because we, we talk about this often, right? That we can't do life alone, that we need one another. If you look across the aisle, right, we need one another. The one another's isn't enough. 
we can be, we can be the most unified body on the planet and not have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. I mean, we, we, can, we can have awesome services. We can have all the flash. We can have, have Pastor Travis ascend out from the stage, right, as, as I'm preaching, right? And some of you are like, oh, that'd be cool. No, that will never happen. That will never happen. I'm claustrophobic. I can't imagine, like, you know, anyway, tight spaces and don't, don't mix, right? Many churches have tried to just get by on their unity without the power of the Holy Spirit and failed. Acts 1.8 is another version of what this is, of what Matthew 28 is, is called. It's the Great Commission. Acts 1.8's version of the Great Commission. And you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus, Jesus says, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. The last thing we need is you out there operating in your own strength. Just wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. David Platt puts it as, as, you know, Peter, don't go out and do this on your own. You'll mess the whole thing up from the start. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's come. Acts chapter 2. Jesus, uh, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit fell on the church, right? And we see the institution of the church. But the point is, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. As we live out our vision this year for Summit Church, my challenge for us is this. Let us, both corporately and individually, not complain about any situation we are in. Because if God has brought us to it, He's going to give us the power to get through it. Don't panic to the left, to the right, up, down. Because God is in control. Because God is in control. You're not. I'm not. The elders that we had sitting up here sharing prayer requests with you last week, four out of five of them way longer than seven minutes. We had one stay within the time frame. We'll do better next year. And some of you are like, Pastor Travis, you didn't even stay within seven minutes. That wasn't my rule. That was their rule. And then they were like, oh, power trip. Well, back to this. God is with us. Doesn't mean it won't be hard doesn't mean what we're about to walk through this year as a church where we're going to go home. I was texting the staff this past week and just, just, you know, uh, just, just, just thinking, about, thinking about what's coming th- this year, right? Summit's going home. We've never had a home. Like, like we've, we've, we've occupied some spaces that were other people's home for a while, but Summit Church has never had a home. And so we're getting to go home. This is our first home. Now, think back to your first home. Was it perfect? No? Somebody was like, no, no, not even a little bit. Okay, a shack, maybe? Okay, anyway, right? Maybe a little underwhelming? Right? But it'll it'll be our first home. It'll be our first home. We get to go home together. So here's the question I want to ask you when we think about through the power of the Holy Spirit. What power is fueling your life? Why are you here? What, what's giving you the strength for your day-to-day as you walk with Jesus? Okay, then let's look. Okay, we're, 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 again, we're working kind of backwards, okay? So through the power of the Holy Spirit. Second point I want to make is through Jesus. Making disciples of Jesus Christ. Not Travis, okay? Not Dylan, not Ian, not Jim, Dan, or, or Zan, not right in, through the uh, making disciples of Jesus. Excuse me. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and behold, I'm with you always, teaching everything I've commanded. See, here's the, here's the deal. Jesus saves. I don't. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him him would not perish but have everlasting life. 
Jesus came to save the world, not condemn the world. I don't save, you don't save. The, 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 the goal here, the, the, the purpose of the church and what Peter talked about and Paul talked about, follow me as I follow Christ. Everything we do, look at your neighbor and say everything, everything, must point to Jesus. It must point to Jesus. It must point to Jesus. Jesus is for you. And our goal, our vision as a church is to not point you to to a pastor or to a ministry or to a program, but point you ultimately through Jesus, to Jesus, to Jesus. Through those programs, through our small groups, through our preaching, through our teaching, through our music, that everything we do points to Jesus. And so our pursuit of Him, Jesus, above all else. And so my question for you here is, does your life point to Jesus? As you think about what we're doing here at Summit Church, does everything that we do here point to Jesus? Point to Jesus. Next point, working backwards again by making disciples. For some of you, that's really tweaking you, and I apologize. But as I was looking at it, I just thought, let's start at the end and work backwards because I think it's just better this way. I'm glad you see it my way. Making disciples. Now we we feel we feel there's there's two major elements of summit, and we're making some moves right now as we prepare to move into the building at some point in 2023. Um, we're, we're we're making some shifts to make sure that everything we do reflects these priorities. But we want to focus on two things: discipleship and outreach. And so here we see Jesus saying, "Make disciples of all nations." Make disciples of all nations. How? Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that gives the church some, some job security. Right? Because if we're talking about teaching everything that he's commanded us, we've got time. Right? We've got time. And how many of you think that you're going to perfect the things that Jesus taught this side of heaven? Ain't it going to happen, right? So again, job security. We, 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 as long as we're pursuing Christ, as long as we are in that flow, the church isn't going to go anywhere. The church isn't going to go anywhere. The church will exist. The church will be here. It may not look the same. It may not sound the same. It may not smell the same. But it'll be here. It'll be here. When I talk about making disciples, I, I like to talk about a couple things. First of all, it's everything together. Like, think about everything together. Now, I know, I know, trust me, um, if, if, if I'm fixing something around the house, or for some of you, I'll translate that. If I'm fixing something, right? That's the southern in me. Fixing. If I'm fixing, or I'm fixing to do something, or I'm fixing to go somewhere, right? If I'm fixing something around the house, what's the most efficient way to fix it? Well, yeah, I guess call somebody. Thank you for your confidence in me. You know what? I think 12 years is a good run. I didn't think it could get any worse than what Zan did to me last week. Where's he at? Okay. Without calling in a specialist... The most efficient way to get something done is to do it yourself, right? You're not waiting on somebody, well, until you mess it up more, <laughs> right? Which is called call a specialist, right? Until, until you mess it up more, right? And, and, but you don't think that you're going to do that because this is going to be an easy thing. It'll take me 20 minutes and it'll be done and we'll forget about it. And then two months later, you call the specialist, <laughs> Has this happened for y'all? Because she is laughing a lot. Okay, very good. Good to know. 
call a specialist, Michael. Okay. Um, where was I? Okay, so I know, I know how this goes, right? So to do everything together, we've got to resign ourselves to the fact that it's going to take more time. But again, we've got more time. We're in this for eternity, right? We're in this for eternity. Um, when, when we think about making disciples of all nations, right, it, studies have shown, papers have been done, research has been done to, to show that it takes seven years. Jesus did it in three and a half, but you're not Jesus, okay? It takes seven years to, to, to truly make a disciple to where they begin to emulate your life. Seven years. When we think about that, Summit Church isn't even seven years. We're about to turn five in a couple weeks. Right? But you think about being in relationship with someone in an intentional way where you're teaching them everything that Jesus has commanded for seven years. That's together ministry. And, and I can promise you, in that seven years, you're going to want to walk out of that relationship. You are go- there are going to be days where you're like, this isn't worth it. I've been betrayed. I've been backstabbed. This, this is too much. You're going to want to walk out of that relationship in seven years. But I can promise you, I can promise you, if you stick it through, something happens. Oh, man. And it's sweet. It's sweet. It is sweet. So when I like to talk about, when I talk about discipleship, I, I like to talk about everything together. But then, a little more practically... Okay, there's four, there's four phases of discipleship. The first one is this. I do, you watch. I do, you watch. So if, if I was going to teach you how to shoot a jump shot, if I was going to teach you how to, how to hit a golf club, if I was going to teach you how to study the Bible, if I was going to teach you how to preach a message, if I was going to teach you... If I, if I was going to teach you anything, how to swing a softball bat, how to, how to throw a softball, how to do any of those things, right? If I was going to teach you anything, the chances are the best way to do it is, is that I would do it first and have you watch. However many times you needed to get it. Because how many, how many of you know some, some people need to watch something more? You see this on The Amazing Race all the time, how they have the model things. And anybody into that show? Right? They have, the, and they, have the, they have the imitation thing, and you have to go, and you have to watch it. Some people watch it like one time, and then boom, they go back. They do the, they do the, they do the um, um, thing, right? <laughs> they do the thing, and then they move on. Some people have to go back, and they have to watch it like 15, 20 times before they can perfect the project that they're, that they're, that they're trying to complete so before they can move on, right? So some people need to see it more than other people, but, but, but no matter what, in teaching, the most effective way I do, you watch, right? Then, and, and here's the issue, is that many of us stop there, Many of us in the church, when we think about discipleship, hey, I'm going to do this, you just watch, and then, and then go do it yourself. Right? Many of, us, many of us do that, and that is why I am convinced that so many people get disenchanted with the church, because they get bored. Because everybody's doing the thing, and nobody's letting anybody else come in and do the thing. And so, and so, and so uh, at, at some point, you've got to transition from I do, you watch, to I do, you help. That's the second phase. I do, you help. Now again, when you're doing this with your seven-year-old son, your five-year-old daughter, your 12-year-old daughter, 13-year-old daughter, right? it's going to take more time to have them help. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Because then when they're mowing the grass, and you don't have to, and you get to sit on the deck and watch them do it, It's good. That kind of kills the illustration of discipleship, doesn't it? But anyway, you get the point, right? I do, you help, right? I do, you help. And then that's really, that's really where discipleship has stopped for years and years and years. But we, well, we're forgetting at least two more steps. The third step is you do, I help. So now we're at the place where, you, you know, if you're the teacher, if you're the discipler and not the disciplee, you're taking a step back. And, and what's beautiful in this, what's beautiful in this is as the discipler, right, you've got to become 
content with the fact that they may find a more efficient way to do the thing that you've done for years, but they're going to find a way to do it on their own, and it's going to be just as good, and it's going to get the job done, and it's going to accomplish the thing, and it's not going to be exactly the way that you've done it, but build a bridge and get over it because they are finding their own way. They're finding their voice. They're finding their way to do things and to walk with Jesus. And it's okay. It's beautiful. It's the way it's supposed to be. If every disciple that Jesus had did things exactly the way that Peter did, we would be a mess. We needed a Thomas. We needed a doubter. Right? We needed a storyteller in John. And so don't, don't throw stones at the, at the one that just sits around and tells stories all the time. We need him. We need her. We need people to find their own way to do things. Discipling somebody doesn't mean that they do everything exactly the same way as you do. It means you teach them to find the way that Jesus, uh, that that works for them, to pursue Christ with everything they've got. And so you, and so the third step is you're going to do and I'm going to help. I'm going to help. I'm going to walk alongside of you. I'm going to say, ah, no, you want to slide that just a little bit to the right. Oh, no, you want to, you want to, if you're shooting a jump shot, you want to bring that elbow in just a little bit. Don't get it out here. You want to bring that elbow in just a little bit. If you're swinging a softball bat, you don't want to drop the hands, right? You want to keep that back elbow up, right? You're doing, but I'm helping. And then the last phase. Well, The fourth one. You do, I watch. You do, I watch. So you're going to go do the thing, and I'm going to watch. I'm going to sit back. You're going to do the thing. You're going to do the thing. And I'm not going to criticize. I'm going to celebrate. Right? I'm going to celebrate. And then the last step is then we go and do it again. We go and do it again. We go and do it again. That is the legacy, the generation of discipleship that Summit Church was built on. That we would make disciples of all nations. That we'd make disciples of all nations. That we would walk through this process. See, Summit Church, a lot of people, a lot of people think, you know, Summit Church, and they're like, oh, you know, you're, you're talking about reaching Christian perfection. Not at all. We, we, our prayer, the, rate, the way we got Summit Church was that we wanted people to summit at this generational disciple making, where you became, each and every one of you became a spiritual parent, where you were doing this process with someone, where you became a spiritual grandparent, where you could watch your, your disciple, right? The, the disciple that, that, that you made through the power of the Holy Spirit then go and make another disciple. And so the, you're, a, you're a spiritual grandparent. What a beautiful, what a beautiful picture of the church. What a beautiful picture of the church. Bank disciples of all nations. It's multiplication. So here's the deal. Who are you walking with? Who are you walking with? Who are you walking with in this way? To the purpose of making disciples. Not that they know everything about the patriots that you know. Not that they know everything about the Red Sox that you know. Not that they know how to build something that you know how to build or how to do something that you know how to do. How are they being pushed to walk with Jesus the way that you walk with Jesus? Kristen, my wife, has amazing ideas. And one of the most recent amazing ideas that she had was um, Micah, our daughter, turned 13 this past week. I have two teenagers in the house. Pray for me. (laughs) And um, one of Kristen's ideas to make 13 special was was to find 13 women to write Micah a card. And I don't know if I was supposed to or allowed to, but Micah left her binder and left the notebook where these 13 uh, letters lived in my car on Wednesday because she wanted to read them on the way to school because she got it Wednesday morning. She wanted to read them. She was trying to read them all before school started. And I think she got 11 out of the 13 done. And so, you know, as I was driving around throughout the day and going from 
different meeting to different meeting and all of that. I'd pull one out and read it and, you know, a couple, shed a couple tears and stuff like that and then go on. But it was amazing to me to see all 13 of those women impart a truth about Christ in each letter to inspire Micah. All the believe, you know, most, most of them. We had a couple coaches and, and stuff like that write some cards. But anyway, all of the Bible-believing, Jesus-following women that wrote her a card inspired her with some biblical truth. And I'm, like, I'm just like, because if I'm Micah, I'm hanging on that thing for life. That's gold. And when you have a bad day and some stupid boy, because they're all boys are stupid, some stupid boy dumps you, right? You just go read that and get reassured right, of everything, right, it's beautiful, and one of the things that I, I, I did last summer as I was talking uh, to, to students, specifically in the month of August, um, and as I, would, as I was traveling around last summer and speaking, one of the things that, one of the things that I talked about that God kind of pressed on my heart last spring, and I know I talked about it here, I think it was back in the fall um, when we were talking about relationships, is this, why do we wait till someone passes away to tell them exactly how we feel about them. The good things. We, we wait till someone's gone to tell them about the, the impact that they've had in our life. Right? We, tell, we, we, wait until, we wait until we can't be face to face with them. I've never met a person that said, you know what? I had every conversation with that person I ever wanted to have when they died. But every funeral I do, every funeral I go to, what's the thing you hear? Oh, if I could have one more conversation. If I could have one more meal. If I could have one more trip. If I could have one more. If I could have one more. If I could have one more. Let me tell you something. If I could have one more conversation with my dad, oh my word. I might actually figure it out. If I could have one more, one more, one more. If I could have one more conversation with Herb Perry. If I could have one more, if I could have one more. Right? Who are you walking with in such a way where you're telling them the things that you're inspired by in them? Where you're telling them, the, you're asking them questions. You're asking them questions. I'm sure... Well, let's move on. Let's move on. Make disciples. Who are you walking with? Power of the Holy Spirit. Making disciples of Jesus. Making disciples. Walking together. Two more. Some of church will glorify God and advance His kingdom. We're going to talk about advancing His kingdom. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, Go and make disciples. Look at your neighbor and say, Go. 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 Now, common misconception when we read the Great Commission, when we talk about the Great Commission, is we read the word go, and we think, oh, I've got to go, right? I've got to go to the DR, I've got to go to Zambia, I've got to go to Guatemala, I've got to go to, to, to Vegas, right? People need Jesus in Vegas, right? I've got, I've got to go, right? I've got to get on a plane, and I've got to go somewhere. But if you study Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, and you read that word go, the literal meaning from the Greek is as you go, make disciples. So what that means is as you're going to Hannaford, as you're going to Idex, as you're going to Unum, as you're going to, to the Gorham School Department, as you're going to school, as you're going here, as you're going there, as you go about. I, I, I shared with you last week, uh, and my prayer for you is that you would fall in love with your community, the community that you're in, the people that you do life with. That's where we advance his kingdom. And so as you go to work, as you go play, as you go with your family, as you go, make disciples of all nations. Because among us, we have mechanics. Among us, we have business people. Among us, we have, we have tradespeople. We have, we have all. The, so if, if each one of us is glorifying God and advancing his kingdom in our platform, guess what? The kingdom is expanded in all nations. In all nations. Now, that doesn't mean we don't go to other places. Like Maryland just went to 
Mexico and, and we're going to the DR in a few weeks and we're going to, you know, it doesn't, doesn't mean that we don't go from time to time to be inspired. But truly, the vision is that as we're going, we're making disciples. As we're going, we're making disciples. Your community, your people. And so are you pointing people to Jesus? Are you pointing people to Jesus? And then lastly, glorify God. Now, I want to show you something. If, you're, if you have Matthew chapter 28 open in your Bible, I want to back up to verse 16. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, let me, let, me, let, me, let me catch you up to what's happening here, okay? Jesus has just been crucified. He's been resurrected. He's spending about 40 days with his closest uh, disciples and, 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 and family and friends and all of that. About 120 people is guesstimated um, to be around the scene when Jesus ascended into heaven in the book of Acts. And so what the disciples are doing when they're hearing this is they're worshiping Jesus as he's been resurrected. He's come back to life. They're worshiping, but they're trying to figure out what's next. There's some, there's some uh, I'm sure, Thomas, right? I'm sure there's some skepticism as to what's next, right? Thomas, is, Thomas has been putting fingers in the holes. Jesus has been recalling Peter and re- restoring Peter back to, you know, back to love and all of those things. And, 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 and there's, there's, kind of this, there's kind of this lull and in, 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 in they're trying to figure out what's next, And so they were worshiping Jesus on the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Big statement, right? Jesus, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, as I read the gospels now, 2,000 years later, I'm like, duh, disciples, wake up, see it, right? It's kind of like when when you're watching that TV show, when you're watching Jeopardy, how can you not know the answer to this question? It's obvious. It's right in front of you. But when you're right in the thick of things, how many of you know you don't necessarily see things as clearly as you get to on, from the benefit of watching it 20 times on your DVR and being able to figure it out, right? And so they're worshiping Jesus. They're trying to figure out what's next. And Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore. And so when we talk about glorifying God, underline, highlight, star the word, therefore. Because Jesus says, whenever we see the word therefore in Scripture, we've got to ask what the therefore is there for. Right? Right? Go therefore and make disciples. What's that therefore, therefore? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Therefore, his plan for the world to be reached, all reach, go and make disciples of all nations. That's the plan. And so I want you to see this. This is huge for us as the church of Jesus because this is why we exist. This is why we exist. This is why we're here. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, week after week after week, day after day after day. Why Summit exists, why every church exists, is to glorify God by going and making disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teaching them, not assuming that they know just because they're Christian. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And knowing that you're not alone in doing it. That he's with you always to the end of the age. He's going to take care of you. It might be hard. It might be lonely at times. But he is with you. He's with you. He's with you. And so as the disciples are standing there with Jesus on this mountain, worshiping Him, doubting. What's next? Jesus looks at him. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go make disciples of all nations. Go and do it. Advance my kingdom. Teach them my ways. Do it. Do it. And I'm going to be with you. No matter what, I'm going to be with you. 
as much as you don't feel my presence, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. So when we talk about our vision, we talk about five ways. The power of the Holy Spirit. We've got to have it. We've got to have it. We've got to have it. We're making disciples of Jesus, no one else, nothing else. That's where cults come in. It's not where we're going. We're making disciples of Jesus. We're making disciples. We're going to do ministry together. We're going to do life together. We're going to walk together. It's going to be messy. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be ugly, but it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. We're going to advance his kingdom. It's not about us. It's not about our comforts. It's not about our bubble. If we're concerned about those things, we're not concerned about advancing his kingdom. I'm going to be honest with you. The person that sits and says, oh, I like my little small church where I know everyone. Let me tell you something. You're not going to know everybody in heaven. But guess what? It's not going to matter. Because the only thing that matters in heaven is the presence of Jesus. Oh, that that would be the case here. Let's practice. Let's rehearse that. Where week after week after week, we get to rehearse heaven where nothing matters. Nothing matters except the presence of Jesus. The person in front of you's hair doesn't matter. Ripped jeans don't matter. Song selection don't matter. How long Pastor Travis talks doesn't matter if he bleeds into the Patriots game. Whatever. We experience Jesus. It's awesome. thought she was coming to stop me. <laughs> For this next part, I wish I had some golf clubs. Oh, look at that. Yeah. All right, so how are we going to do this? Again, some of you have heard this before, but we haven't done this in quite a while. So those of you that play golf, what's this called? The driver. The driver. It's nicknamed, right, the big stick, right? You grip it and rip it. This is the biggest club. It's the longest club in the bag. It's the club that if you hit it right, will go the furthest. And so how do we accomplish this vision? Well, I'm glad you asked. Drivers, irons, putters. We see what we're doing here on Sunday morning as a driver. A driver. There's some of you in here that have been a Christian for a long time. Quite a few years You've probably heard sermons on almost every passage in the Bible. You've led Sunday school classes. You've led small groups. Some of you in here have preached more sermons than, than, than I can count, I can imagine. Right? Some of you don't know Jesus. Some of you are trying to figure this thing out. Some of you are trying to... But yet we're all sitting in the same room, listening to the same message, experiencing the same service, and being spoken to by the same God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And so we approach Sunday morning like we approach a driver. When I pull this club out on the golf course and I step onto the tee box and I put my little tee in the ground and I put a ball on top of it and I position myself to hit that, and I go back, and then I come, I'm not going to hit anything, am I? And then I come forward, and I hit that ball, right? Guess what? I have no clue where it's going. <laughs> Whatsoever. Absolutely no idea. It may go 50 yards left. It might go 50 yards right. It might, on a good day, go 275 yards right down the middle if I'm lucky, if I really got a hold of it, right? But chances are, it's not going to go where I want it to go. I can probably count less than 10 times, maybe even less than five, where I've looked at, you know, golfing buddies or people that I've been golfing with and say, you know what, I'm going to hit this thing right at that tree and it's going to fade just over that mound and it's going to hit the other end of that mound and it's going to bounce and just go forward. Doesn't happen. That's a goal. Doesn't happen. And that's Sunday morning. 
as we tee up with the sermons, as we tee up with the music, as we do these different things and we hit it from this stage and we prepare different things and we do different things, we have no idea where it's going to land with you. No idea. But we trust that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to your heart exactly what you need to hear today. And it's amazing to me how that happens. Week after week after week, I'll step down from here and I'll say, man, I didn't really connect with this. And one of you will walk down and say, Pastor Travis, when you said this, that is exactly what I needed to hear today. I was walking out last Sunday and Mark Harriman looked at me and said, when you said this, it was exactly what I needed to hear. And I thought to myself, I said that? Huh. I guess I should put that in the notes. We trust the Spirit. And so our Sunday morning is our driver where it's open to everyone, anyone, members, non-members. We want you to be here. We want you to experience Jesus. And we're trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to speak the message to your heart that you need to hear week after week, day after day. Then, ah, this is my most comfortable club in the bag. Randy, this is a seven iron right here. Feels good. All right, feels good. I wish it was about 50 degrees warmer so we could go out and play today. But anyway, um, irons, you've got different irons, and the difference in irons, a little bit of a golf history lesson for you, right? Each iron is at a different angle to get different loft, therefore different distance, right? So you hit an eight iron about 150, 160 yards. You hit a pitching wedge about 120 yards. You hit a five iron about 200 yards, right? So you have all these different irons in your bag for however far you need to hit it. But the purpose of an iron, if I have an iron and I pull an iron out of the bag, the purpose of it is I'm trying to hit the golf ball as close to the pin as I possibly can. And so the purpose of an iron is to get close. It's to get close. Now, if you're in a small group, you know this. That what happens in small groups when you do life together outside of Sunday morning and you have relationship and you're forced to talk because you're in a small group. Now, if you're in a small group of more than 15 people, that's not a small group. That's a church plant. And we should talk. Okay? But small groups and, and all of that, the purpose of them is to get close, is to have conversation, is to get vulnerable, is to share things about, is to learn deeper things in the faith. You know, people that come to me and say, you know, uh, Pastor Travis, I just, I love Sunday mornings, but could we just go deeper? Yes, we can. Join a small group, right? Join a small group. Join a small group, right? Because here's the reality. If you're relying on the driver is the only club in your bag, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. You can't hit this thing off the fairway. You can't hit this thing out of a bunker. I mean, you can. It's going to go really poorly for you. You probably break the club, right? No wonder so many of us get broken in church because we're just trying to live on the Sunday morning experience. I preach to somebody. Anyway, <laughs> Right? But the iron, the purpose of the iron is to get close. And here's what we say in membership class. We say it in base camp all the time. We are going to offer opportunities for irons. 50 plus, small groups, men's breakfast, women's breakfast, all, all, the, all, of, the, all of the type of opportunities, new, um, pizza with the pastors for newcomers, right? All, all these opportunities for, for you, environments for you to come and to get closer to get more plugged in, to get connected. Maybe you can't join a small group consistently. Well, I challenge you, find one family a week that you can just go to dinner with. Get close with them. Get close with them. You can't help but get closer with people if you spend time with people. You can't help it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, so that's the purpose of the irons. Then... The last thing you need in your golf bag, oh, bummer, it's just a little short. Okay, that'll work. The last thing you need a bag is the putter. Now, there's a saying in golf. You drive for show, you putt for dough. And that's true. If you can putt, whew, you're a great golfer. Now, you, you can also be like me where you just get up there and guess and wing it kind of like you do at putt-putt, or as you call it up here, mini-golf, okay, where you've got the spinny thing and the clown and the windmill and all that stuff, right? You just grip it and rip it, right? But the purpose of the putter 
is to get it in the hole. That's the purpose of the putter. That's the purpose of the putter. And so the, pur- the purpose of the putter at Summit Church is this. Come here, Justin. Come here. I was going to call on a couple other people. They had all stuff in their lap, and you just had coffee, so I figured you were safe. Come on, up here. The purpose of the putter is that I want to be close enough to Justin where I can put things into his life and vice versa. Where we can sit across the table from each other and Justin can say, hey, you look tired. What's up? You're frustrated. What's up? I've noticed something different about you. What's going on? How's your walk with Jesus? How can I pray for you? Instead of Justin sitting back and saying, man, you know what? Pastor just looks frustrated. Pastor just looks frustrated. Maybe, maybe I should, you know, go to a different church where the pastor's just not frustrated. Good luck. <laughs> Finding one of those. But many of us sit back and we die on the hill of good intentions because we sit and think, man, I should really. But we never do. I should really go and have coffee with that person. I should really go spend some time with that person. Oh, but they're probably too busy. They're probably too busy. Ah, they probably wouldn't say yes. Oh, I'm probably not the person. I'll just trust that someone else is going to do it. Find two or three people in your life that you get close enough with them that you can put things into their life and you will be a person that someone wants to be like forever. Because many of us struggle to find one. Many of us struggle to find one that we can walk close enough in our life with where we can put things into one another's life. But that's our vision for you is that you don't just be a Sunday morning Christian here. You can go ahead. It was just comforting to have you next to me. (laughs) That you don't just become a Sunday morning believer, but if you really want to do this thing, that you get some irons in your back. And you get around a group of people that you want to get close to. And ultimately, and the thing we say about our small groups is getting close to God and each other. And then finding a couple people in your life that you get close enough with that you can put some things into their life. And they can put some things into yours. Again, not just useless knowledge, but things of God, things of the Bible. So that's who we are. That's what we do. That's our focus. As a leadership, that's what we're built on, birthed on, is that we want to glorify God because this is His thing. We want to advance His kingdom because heaven's going to be amazing. And I've got some friends that I do life with and I want them to experience it. And we're going to do it by making disciples of Jesus, not Summit, not Travis, through the power of the Holy Spirit. By offering Sunday morning services where hopefully you receive something from God through us. Small groups and iron opportunities where you can get close with God and one another. And then putter relationships. And it's really hard to facilitate, right? But putter relationships where you can build some relationships with each other. Where you're close enough to put things into one another's life. Now as the worship team comes, the thing I want to challenge you with as we close today. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always. 
even to the ends of the age. Where do you need to be pushed in this today? Where do you need to be stretched in this today? Maybe you need to sign up for a small group. Maybe you need to, maybe you need to go to that person that you've been avoiding for a long time and say, hey, we need to have some coffee. Maybe you, you insert it. But what is your role as Summit Church? And members, I'm talking to you. We need you. We need you. We need you. What is your role in this vision? Let's not get comfortable and complacent saying, oh, they've got enough. No, we don't. Let's not use portable as an excuse. Oh, when we get into the new building, then we'll become a church. God help us. It's not an excuse. I told the setup team this morning, I am going to really be sad when we leave this place. I love being portable. The things we've got, the people we've gotten to connect with here because we're not in a creepy old church. It'll just be a creepy new church, I guess. I'm going to miss this. I'm going to miss this. But we're turning the page and it'll be good. But what's your role? What's your place here? For some of you, I want to challenge you to do this this year. And I haven't really done this, I don't think, ever, maybe once before. But for some of you that are kicking the tires here of Summit Church, and maybe you're just kicking the tires of church in general, what do you have to lose? I challenge you, encourage you, you may view it as pressuring you. I pressure you. Whatever. I've got nothing to lose. Dive in. Head first. Dive in. Take the risk. Spend a year with us. Come to everything. Do everything that you can. Come to everything that you can. Don't overextend yourself and burn yourself out. Don't hear that. Okay? Within reason. But dive in. There's a couple that I know that were on the fringe for a long time. I wish I could tell you their names, but I didn't get their permission before doing this, so I'll keep them unnamed. Let's just say Travis and Kristen. And I invited them to join a small group last spring, and they came. And today they're all but leading that small group. And they're seeing God move all around them. And I can tell, not because I'm able to be as close to them as I want to be, but because they have a different demeanor about them. He doesn't fall asleep in church anymore. I see it all. You might think you're hiding back there. I see it all. And I want that same testimony for each and every one of you in this room. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But it'll be good. So if you're on the fringes, what do you have to lose? Dive in with us. See what God does. There's no place I would rather be. And I pray you feel the same way. God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your church. Thank you for the mission that you have given your church. And I pray this year that Summit would be found faithful. Above all else, that we would be found faithful. No matter what, we would be found faithful. And so God, I pray that you'd be with us as we go. I pray that we would advance your kingdom, that we would see people come to know you this year. 
I pray that we would make disciples of your son Jesus. And that we would do it all through the power of your Holy Spirit. We need you. Thank you for the gift of your church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.